大家好，我是台北杂志工会的理事长刘振生。面对这波无人能挡的全球疫情，对出版与媒体产业而言，在数位运营跟数位转型中，需要的不只是危机处理，更需要的是危机入市。为了布局疫情后快速变迁的产业脉动，台北杂志工会特别举办规划“后疫情时代国际媒体新商业模式”的线上论坛。第一场线上论坛，我们邀请国际期刊联盟 （FIPP） 的总裁暨执行长 James Hughes 主持，来跟我们分享在今年第四十三届世界媒体大会线上年会所发表的最新版《世界媒体创新报告》演讲，讨论关于疫情期间产业趋势、商业模式、人才留任与永续经营等议题。接下来，让我们一起听听他们的分享。Now, our presenters for this session are the co-editors of this book. They are, of course, Juan Senor, the president of Innovation Media Consulting, and John Wilpers, IMC's senior director for the USA. Gentlemen, welcome to the Congress, and over to you. Thank you, James. Thank you, thank you, James. Well, this is the book that we put together every year for the last 11 years, and it's the most successful media innovations in the world, gathered from. 12 months of our research and global media experience. And what it has in here is chapters on 13 monetization models, has how to be creative、uh, in media, has a chapter on sustainability, has a chapter on podcasting. And today we're going to talk about sustainability and human capital. But first, we have a broader view of what's going on. So, Juan. Thank you, thank you, John, and、uh, yeah, great to connect with all of you <laughs> via、uh, these wonders of technology in this、uh, very fragile world. And、uh, fragility is indeed perhaps、uh, one of the themes of the book.、Uh, trying to figure out how we all、uh, are going to hold this business together. And、uh, I'm happy to say that there's some some incredible insights、uh, from the book this year. So worth getting the book、uh, as an additional help. Uh, to all the work that FIP is doing、uh, to help us guide us through this uh, incredible uh, perfect storm,、um, as you know, the book is done every year based on 12 months of research and our global media、uh, consulting experience.、Um, we are indeed、uh, been in contact with a lot of publishers、uh, like you. Who are facing this? So we've been trying to to get from them their insights as to how they're coping with this, and 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 share those insights with you. So we have been holding uh, uh, free sessions with many clients、uh, as a as a way to help our clients, uh, and uh, and and we've learned a lot. We've gleaned a lot of incredible insights from the publishers for somehow、uh, managing this whole thing. Uh, well,、uh, some perhaps not so well, and others、uh, just getting out of a very deep hole that they're in as a result of it all.、Um, you know your company. We we know the industry, and that's our spirit with this book to try to share, to give you the barometer of、uh, what's happening out there. We try to disrupt the disruption that is out there. It can be disrupted if you have a game plan. We'll talk about that in a moment, and we try to organize the chaos, the chaos that、uh, we face. Uh, now on a daily basis, and probably for the next six months to come.、Um, part of it, as well, is is trying to take advantage of this whole thing to to relaunch your legacy. This is a good time to do so. We'll talk about this in a moment. And transforming staff, we found, and this was uh, uh, serendipitous uh, insight that we had. That really is about people.、Uh, this transformation that is due, long overdue, for many publishers. Uh, has to be led by the right people in the right jobs with the right motivation and the right policies for retention. And John will talk in detail about this: how it is important to have a strategy, but also to put the right people behind that strategy to execute it. And some of our clients in the last、uh, few years. And、uh, perhaps the headline for for it all、uh, is this wonderful quote:、uh, "Do not." Let a good crisis go to waste, and、uh, and and indeed, it's difficult. It's easier to say it, obviously, than to do it. But all the publishers that we've been talking to in the last、uh, seven months, they really have taken on this attitude. They've said, "Let's somehow、uh, turn this into、uh, an opportunity, and let's work on it rather than be passive, rather than just wait for this to pass." This is perhaps the greatest mistake you can make to let 
this pass uh, to shelter in place, to just let the storm go by. This is not a hurricane. This is not uh, something that uh, has a definitive uh, day of ending. This is a transformative historical event uh, for humanity and obviously for our industry as well. Uh, you need to, to, to try to figure out how to get a hold of it. Uh, and, and, and this is very, very important to have that attitude of, uh, of opportunity rather than uh, of victimism. And um, we also have been hearing this quote repeatedly. And we think it's just so relevant that there are decades where, where nothing happens and, and weeks where decades happen in our case months where decades are happening. Uh, I'm sure you've also heard the fact that uh, uh, there have been a lot of trends that are now becoming the norm. They're accelerating. And, uh, and as you know, in the book, uh, for the last 10 years, we've been tracking those trends. We've been tracking those innovations. And they're all proving true. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, and we're not saying this because we had a prescience. We, we, we somehow knew what was coming uh, with a certainty. But uh, the guesses, the educated guesses we made and we wrote about in all the books um, are becoming true. Uh, so we encourage you to look back at some of the other books and look at best practices recorded in some of the other books and this year's book, because these innovations are becoming the norm. Uh, and, and, and we're also seeing that uh, in addition to accelerating, in, in many cases are being trunc truncating the entire dynamic of a company. So you're being forced to embrace these innovations, uh, which makes change even more difficult because, yeah, you can embrace it. But if this is being forced upon you and you're not ready or the mindset is not ready or you don't have the right people to, to launch these new things you need to do, it's very, very difficult. Yes. So what are some of these um, trends? Well, the first one is obviously the migration of readers from print to digital. Anybody who still pretends that you can uh, continue or rebuild or carry on your business, anchoring it all on print, um, the pushback is massive uh, globally to print. And, and uh, it's, it's a silly thing, but unfortunately, uh, people are now uh, considering uh, the habit of using it a, ma a magazine that you would share in the past at a dental office or, or uh, at hairdressers or, or somewhere, uh, something that could be a, a vector, a vector for transmission. So that has led to a lot of people saying, okay, I, I, I love, I love the lean back print magazine experience, but I can't do it. I'm afraid. So therefore, but I still want the content. So, so you really must be ready. Uh, you must be ready for that. And, 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 and of course, once habits are formed, when people have tasted or decided that they will consume your content uh, digital first, uh, then it's difficult to bring back the old habit of print first. So you will lose some definitive readers forever to a digital first experience. And of course, as you know, we've said it repeatedly, uh, no medium ever replaces another medium, but just beware that the fact that magazines Scenes, and we must say it and speak about this openly, are considered vectors of possible transmission of this bloody virus. Uh, as a result, um, many people will want your content, still want it on digital first. Unless, of course, the experience is somebody going to the news agent or to the, the shop and buying their own magazine and keeping it at home, which is a huge percentage of the market, but not the majority of the market uh, magazine market experience. The second thing is the migration uh, from ad revenue to reader revenue. Uh, a definitive, uh, definitive uh, trend change. Uh, really, uh, uh, we've seen uh, the plummeting of ad revenue as a result of many companies uh, in, in a dynamic of a dash to cash. So you're trying to prevent uh, the bleeding uh, cash. And of course, uh, the first things that go um, are uh, marketing, advertising budget. So in a situation like this, to, 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 to just be, again, as I said at the beginning, to, to be expecting this to come back when there is a vaccine or, or in the coming months is, is disingenuous. Uh, you really should be uh, thinking about uh, how do I definitively begin, begin the journey to read a revenue, um, uh, upgrade that journey, uh, emphasize it, uh, boost it, uh, whatever you need to do if you've already started in that journey. So at least 40% of your revenue comes from paying readers in digital. Because remember, 
the copy sales are going to be affected, are being affected. So you must now get people to pay for that digital uh, reader paying experience. Another thing that is, uh, it, it's a tangential um, trend that has accelerated and something that we knew could happen and might happen, was beginning to happen, has accelerated massively. And, and again, tangential because it does not have, and yet it does have a direct impact on our industry is the vertiginous collapse of trust in social media platforms. Uh, we've seen um, Instagram influencers, we've seen uh, uh, people with massive followers on Twitter and Facebook uh, sharing uh, conspiracy theories, uh, uh, magic cures, irresponsible comments about how to, how to not die from this thing. And, uh, and uh, many of them with good intentions, some of them just profiteering, honestly. Uh, and that has led to brands rethinking, rethinking their few remaining ad dollars, should we really put them uh, on the accounts of these influencers. And remember for magazines, for consumer journalism, a lot of that money was shifting quickly uh, to not just uh, display advertising, but uh, influencer, social media advertiser. Well, this is a gain for us because uh, indeed uh, our journalism has been very responsible, very accurate when it comes to consumer journalism. And, uh, and yet uh, the social media sharing of, of, of misinformation has led to uh, a crisis of credibility for those uh, influencers and so on that were taking our revenue. So, so this is a very interesting trend and it's something you must articulate when you're selling. So your, your, your sales department should be highlighting this to our advantage. We should be saying, uh, look, if you're putting your money with this actor or the actress or this influencer, just be aware that they have, they're having this credibility crisis. Uh, we're not. We are indeed trying to still do responsible uh, journalism, uh, consumer journalism, in this case, medical journalism, or just uh, sharing tips as to how to cope with this in your family, in your home, etc. This has also led to um, a, a trend that started, started in a very faulty way. And we've talked about it at FIP Congresses uh, for so many years. And, and James has done such a brilliant job of of addressing this head on and having wonderful discussions, uh, open discussions about our, our dysfunctional relationship with Facebook and Google. And we tried and tried to engage with them and try to somehow uh, get them to give the, uh, the, the, the magazine industry, the publishing industry, uh, the, 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 the media industry a better deal. They refused. Uh, this is now led to legislation, as you know, in Australia first, it's coming to Europe in the coming months, and uh, they are now going to be forced to share the revenue, not just from news, but also from any information we provide. The free ride for the duopoly and the triopoly, uh, if you include the other platforms, uh, is over. And that is to our benefit. But of course, you have to uh, capitalize on this, get ready for it. And, uh, and also um, be steady with this because they're trying to undermine the whole legislation and they're trying to, for instance, tell Australian publishers at the moment that we will just stop sharing any content that you produce and so on and so on um, uh, as, as payback for this, uh, this <coughs> piece of legislation. So uh, we need to find that common purpose. As an industry, we must be steady and, uh, and the, the, the model for how that revenue share is going to be, it's quite clear when it comes to Australia. So it should be the same in every other market in Europe and, and elsewhere. But um, not every norm should continue to be the normal. And, and this is a very important point uh, that I would like to emphasize and that we have uh, seen um, in talking to clients uh, globally the last seven months. Uh, please, please, no knee-jerk reactions. Uh, you have to really do this with, with, with head rather than emotion. And, uh, and, and just there's a lot of talk about these new normal things that we don't believe should be the normal going forward. Um, uh, number one, of course, is the whole issue of the stumbled upon uh, work from home editorial department. 
Uh, we, we believe this is complete nonsense uh, and, and we are happy to, to go on the record on this. Uh, this is not the way to make magazines. This is not the way media works. Uh, this is not the way to, to, to create quality content. Uh, the work from home uh, uh, you know, forecast that uh, you know, we should uh, shut down our editorial departments. We, we don't need an office anymore. Uh, all our um, editors, journalists, uh, writers, uh, designers should just go home. <laughs> uh, this is just complete nonsense. Yeah? It, it is a, it's, of course, it's a, it's a temporary necessity, but one that we should try to get people uh, back to the office as soon as possible. Not for political reasons, not to somehow uh, take one position or the other on whatever your country is advising, but, but just because it doesn't make any sense to produce quality media, quality information. Um, you should not really uh, also shut down your print operation out of desperation. Um, and on the other thing about the office, uh, it, it's important to emphasize the fact that, um, you know, uh, to make great magazine content, to, great, to, to make great news content, it's a collaborative effort. Uh, uh, you know, you don't do journalism at home. Uh, you do journalism meeting uh, a, a source. Uh, you do journalism uh, meeting um, a great designer that you do an interview with, uh, meeting them at home, uh, witnessing the story that you then need to retell to your readers. So to pretend that you can do all this from home um, is just, uh, it, just a non-starter. Uh, perhaps from home we could do copy editing and so on, but the, the collaborative effort of, of being with a designer laying down beautiful pages, whether it's online, whether it's in print, whether it's uh, on air, it's a very collaborative effort. And, and we cannot do journalism, uh, consumer journalism, fashion journalism, uh, whatever kind of journalism you're engaged in, hobby journalism, from home, it can be done. Uh, so uh, we do emphasize, beware of, of, of just shutting down your office and doing all this you know, work to come from a shared workspace. The other trend that we are um, warning people against, uh, because we've seen in the last seven months some, some really terrible stumbles with this, uh, is just shutting down the print operation um, out of desperation. And, and in many cases, we're seeing this, that the people are doing this to, it, it, to convince themselves that they're digital first. And, um, and we're seeing a lot of people rushing this. And uh, you, know, you, you, you cannot cut your way to growth. And, and the moment you stop printing that publication, which is your flagship, the moment you force people to end that habit, uh, if the habit is, being, is coming your way, people don't want the print magazine, we understand it. And, and we understand that you obviously perhaps should not perhaps have such a big print run. But then to somehow say that this is the moment to, to become digital first for the sake of saying to yourself that you're digital first, we believe that that's a mistake. Desperate measures for desperate times must not become the norm. You should only become digital first when your revenues are digital first. And, and, and this is something we ask of our clients when they come to us and they say, well, could you advise us on making the migration to digital first? And we say, yes, of course, this is what we do at Innovation, but, 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 but you must do it when your business is digital first. If not, you're giving up uh, a phenomenal size of your business just for the sake of saying, um, well, this is the time to show the market that we're just digital first. And even doing it so is not going to accelerate your digitization within the company. So just because you, you, you cease to print uh, by osmosis, somehow your team uh, learns to do digital first, uh, consumer, fashion, um, hobby journalism. It, it just won't happen. So, so, so beware of this uh, knee-jerk reaction we're seeing, um, something to avoid. And finally, uh, on my part here in terms of, uh, of the big insight is, is just we've been selling the wrong thing. And, and at Innovation, we've been saying this for so long. And, and finally, this is now proving true. Uh, we have to stop selling ads. Our future is digital. And we've been trying to build that future based on digital ad revenue, whether it's display, whether it's uh, programmatic, whether it's what have you, pre-roll, post-roll, mid-roll. Um, that's fine 
that's wonderful, but you're never going to pay the bills with that level of, of digital advertising. And we've been trying to sell ads and we have, we've not been selling journalism. So we've been selling the wrong thing. And you really have to uh, take the step. And if indeed your journalism is not worth selling, then you shouldn't be in this business. Uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult for you to make a living out of just a, 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 an ad-dependent magazine media um, experience on digital. You just won't make it. And um, we're modeling this for many clients. And for some of them, profit comes in 12, 15 years. And in the meantime, you're bleeding red ink um, everywhere. Uh, so unless you're willing to put money into this, uh, the fastest way to profit to sustainability is to find a way to begin to charge for your journalism. Because unless you get people to pay for your information for your journalism it's really it's it's game over yeah you will not be able to sustain um, your media business um and that's we we're working on launching paywalls all over the world our clients are constantly asking us can you help us guide us our way to uh, a paywall future and um and this is perhaps the headline trend that now has become the norm and that we urge you to consider uh, as the greatest uh, innovation uh, that has come out of this past year and will stay with us for the next few years. So you must master, you have to begin the journey to read a revenue, if not, it's game over, because only journalism will save journalism, whether that journalism is fashion journalism, consumer journalism, food journalism, uh, travel journalism, what have you, still, still, you must ask people to pay for it. And you know, and the interesting thing about it all, uh, looking at all this, is that uh, this is not just a, a statement of intent because we need to find a new revenue stream to sustain us. But it, it, you know, people in the past did not value journalism as something worth paying for. This crisis has made them realize that they have to pay for journalism. In a moment where nobody knows the truth, nobody knows what's going on, uh, people have consumed journalism uh, like mad. Uh, and when, when, when journalism, uh, the consumption of that journalism has an impact, a direct impact on your life, on your health, on your survival, on your economic survival, um, people have rediscovered the value of consuming quality journalism. So this is great for us. This is great for us because we must capitalize on this moment in history. And uh, just the same way that a few years ago, um, Netflix launched its service and people realized, now I have to pay for movies. And before that, of course, Spotify launched and convinced the world that they had to pay for music. This has been our moment where people have realized, yeah, I need to pay for quality, reliable information. So you must then develop the self-conviction in your publication, in your brand, to tell your readers, you gotta pay. And if you don't pay, we can continue our business. And, uh, and you will be surprised, many will pay. Uh, but of course, um, <laughs> journalism without people is, is impossible. So you must uh, invest in human capital. And, 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 and John, who is the main author of this book every year, has done a phenomenal, phenomenal job on searching um, really uh, how to get around uh, the importance of human capital. As I said, how to get the right people for the right job and indeed motivate them, retain them, attract them to our industry. So John, over to you to take us through the rest of the book. Great, thank you, Juan. All right, first slide. Despite the fact uh, next slide, sorry. Despite the fact that everything has changed, we're still doing things the old same way. Yes, we're working remotely, and some of us never thought that it would happen this quickly or at the scale that it's happening at. But even before COVID-19, everything was changing dramatically anyway. The skills we're looking for, the types of people we need, the way that we and they communicate with one another, the workplace, the pace of change, and yet, and yet, we're still hiring the same way. 
we still just post ads, we sit back and wait, then we waste tons of money and staff time sifting through hundreds of applicants, many of them from unqualified applicants. And often we do it at the last minute we're in a rush and we end up settling for less than the best. There's a guy at uh, the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania who says, businesses have never done as much hiring as they do today. They have never spent as much money doing it and they've never done a worse job at it. So we believe that we must dramatically innovate around our HR practices. And even if you think you're good at it, you're probably not. Because what worked before doesn't work anymore. And actually, if you're honest, you have to admit that the old way really didn't work predictably all that well anyway, right? Uh, next slide. So we must dramatically change the way we recruit, train, hire, and retain. And this is so important because in this COVID-19 world and the world that follows, if we don't hire, train, and retain the best talent, none of the ideas in the book, none of the ideas that you're hearing in the Congress will be able to work because you don't have the talent to pull it off. So let's start with recruiting and hiring. What did we find in looking around for innovative ways to do that? Top talent is critical. Next slide, please. According to McKinsey, superior talent is up to eight times more proficient. So we, and, and it's, it's, it's fairly well established that, but still, despite that, despite that acknowledged importance of, of acquiring talent, a whopping 82% of companies, according to McKinsey's research, don't believe they recruit highly talented people for all the reasons we just talked about. And worse, 7% of those companies, only 7% think they can keep those people. So how do we entice talent, especially with the relentlessly negative press that the media industry has been getting lately? Next slide, please. We must transform our big companies into alluring employee and focused places. And then we have to market the hell out of it. We must make our, our companies appealing places to work. And then broadly that, broadly market that new culture to be able to attract the people we want because good help really isn't hard to find when top talent is looking for you. And what is top talent looking for? Well, we found there were nine things that the talent, the people that we want to hire are looking for in a company that they want to work for. And only one has to do with money. There's a mission they can believe in, a positive culture, stimulating challenges, professional growth, mentorship, competitive pay, there's the financial one, rewards for excellence that don't have to be financial, advancement opportunities, and flexible work hours and locations. So as a company, each of us needs to do the following. Make sure that your company's mission and values are appealing, clear, and easily discovered. So when somebody goes looking for a company, they hear about your company, they hear about a job opening, they're gonna go looking for you. You want them to find what you want them to find. So you need this stuff to be easily discovered. And then you wanna create an employee focused culture, emphasizing individual growth, flexibility, all those nine items that we found. And then you wanna get your best ambassadors involved in your recruiting, and those are your own employees. Now, why do we go to this, all this trouble? Well, for two reasons at least. 84% of employees, according to McKinsey again, would consider leaving their current job to move to an employer with a fantastic reputation, even if the salary bump was not significant. So it's a win-win. If you do this stuff, you have a happier workforce, and they then become your most enthusiastic ambassadors helping to hire high-quality people yourselves. So how do you go about this? Slide, please. You have to be on the offensive, but you also have to be on the defensive. Let's take the offensive first. You have to market your culture, whether you're looking to hire or not, because when it's time to hire, you won't have the time to create all the information that you want up there for the people to find. 
And then you have to apply marketing strategies, just like you tell your advertisers. You have to expand your social footprint. You have to create content about your culture. You have to do search engine optimization so that when people go looking, they're gonna hunt and they're gonna find you. You have to do landing page conversion optimization. So when they get to your site, you help convert them. You're gonna do content marketing. You do reputation management. You're gonna do social media engagement because content has the power to help potential candidates decide if your company is the right fit for them and vice versa. Content can literally make or break your talent acquisition strategy. But then I talked about defensive, right? You have to go on the defensive. And what does that mean? Well, in this super connected world, you can be doing everything right in terms of brand marketing. But a large part of your brand building, or as it turns out, your brand destruction is happening without any input from you and probably without you even being aware of it. Slide, please. At least five online sites allow current and former staff to rank the CEO, the company itself, the interview process, and most importantly of all, answer the question, would you recommend the company to a friend? Now to me, that's the most important ranking because it amounts to word of mouth. And no people trust nothing more than they trust word of mouth. So next slide, please. And let's take a good look at this slide. There are these five companies that do this ranking where employees and former employees can come in and rank. So take a look. I took a look at the top, top 11 or 11 of the top companies in the media world to see how they ranked. Let's start, let, let, you can see here, you've got Condé Nast, you've got the Meredith Corporation, Berta, India Today, Abril, Dennis, Bonnier, all these guys, big names. So let's start with the overall company ranking. Ha, huh. and this is amazing, right? Only two of the 11 companies hit the average. Not a high ranking, but only two were ranked at the average. Everybody else was below. You look at Condé Nast at 2.8. That would be a real flag, a warning flag for me. You look at Dennis, it's 4.0, but Bonnier 2.5, TVA 2.3. This is pretty amazing stuff. So now let's take a look at the third, second column there, the approval of the CEO. Now Condé Nast ranking poorly did very well with their, their, uh, their CEO ranking. The average here is 68 or 69%. And only half of the companies hit that. So you look at Meredith, 67, barely made it. India Today, Berta did well. SCMP did well, Dennis. But then look at the others, Bonnier, Montadori, TVA at 14%. Let's look at the third column. This is the most important one, recommend to a friend. So the average is 49%. Only a third of the companies hit the average. You know, you'd want your company to be at the top, not at average, struggling to hit average. So you've got Condé Nast at 36% thought they'd recommend it. Meredith, 48. Poor Berta at 38. India Today, 68. But SCMP, Dennis at 61. Bonnier at 34. Now you can find these things and what you need to do, even if you're spending a ton of time and money on your branding, you need, you, you can't afford to have all that be eviscerated by sites like this. So how do you watch your back? Well, you sign up for these, these sites, you then follow your profiles, you sign up to receive alerts whenever somebody posts to your site, you develop a plan for responding to those sites. What do you say when somebody says something negative? How do you handle that? And by doing that, you encourage more reviews by addressing and actually answering. Most of the companies I saw here didn't bother to answer, so the criticism was left un, unanswered, unchallenged. You do not ask employees for reviews. You do not pay employees for reviews, nor do you pay to buy fake reviews, but you do let your staff know that if they feel so inclined, you really appreciate a good review. So next, move on to retention. Remember the slide that said uh, only 7% of the companies think they can keep the good people they have? Well, there's a very high cost for not retaining your very best talent. Not the least of which the cost of recruiting, hiring, onboard training can run anywhere from nine to 200% of the annual salary of the person who's leaving. Then you have lost productivity, decreased morale because you're not hiring from within, disrupted culture, lost institutional knowledge, lost smooth working relationships, teams being interrupted, 
existing staff looking to leave because they see you're not going to be hiring from within. In addition to the time and effort of hiring, outside hires, this is an amazing statistic, outside hires take three years to perform as well as an internal hire. And then on the flip side, internal hires take seven years to earn as much as an outside hire. So it's really in, internal hiring, if you can do it, is a no-brainer. And how do you go about that? What, what we found, could the next slide please? But let's take a look at what the 13 strategies are. You start with smart onboarding practices. The minute that people get on board and get hired, you start onboarding them. You create a mentor program. You provide thoughtful, professional feedback on a regular basis. You give special attention to the 5% of your staff who create 95% of the value. You create an employee value proposition and you do that in conjunction with your staff. You shut up and listen regularly. You regularly go out and ask people, what's going on? How do you feel? And then you act on the results of that listening because if you don't act on those results, that's the worst thing you can do. Then people will never talk to you again. Remember, it's not about all the perks, just the right perks. You have to talk to your employees to figure out what those are. You help your people grow, you train regularly, you promote from within. You become more family friendly. You regularly look at your pay rates versus other media companies. You encourage a work-life balance. And if you start a new project, you start by stopping something they're currently doing to be able to give them the bandwidth to achieve the new project. Now in the book, in the chapter on human capital, we also talk about how do you set up a mentorship program? How do you create an employee referral program? The five sites where you and your companies get rated. What is human analytics and how to choose a system? I, I encourage you to read that piece of the chapter. It's fascinating stuff and has a big impact on people hiring, on the whole process. How to hire women and the five questions to ask at a stay interview. When you sit down with somebody, you want to make sure they're going to stay. What do you, what do you talk about? Next. So now we're going to talk about going green, sustainability. And next. So, crickets. Why am I showing a cricket? <laughs> I'm showing a cricket because there's a dearth of any or any substantial environmental, environmental sustainability initiatives at many media companies. Now, maybe that's because we've just been struggling to survive, but there was a rush of sustainability activity about 10 years ago when the topic was initially hot. But now in our, our research, we find that going green seems to have been reduced to creating editorial packages about climate change, spelling out how businesses and governments and, and our readers can and should become good environmental citizens. But as far as us ourselves is concerned, uh, not so much. Now, to be fair, I did find some media companies who have created environmentally, environmental sustainability mission statements. They've established internal teams to examine their own processes and practices. They've identified measurable goals after identifying what their carbon footprint is. They've published the results of their efforts. But my review of the 30 largest media companies in the world, followed by a Google search of all media companies, any sustainability activities, revealed virtually nothing. Many media companies have no sustainability policies or goals at all. And of those that do, many have statements and goals, but they've never been substantiated with progress reports, or those are progress reports have not been updated in years. And, and the sad thing is some media companies probably do have sustainability policies and results that I missed, but the Google search demonstrates their failure at promoting those efforts. So they might as well not be doing them because you want your readers to know about it. You want the country to know about it. Next. Sustainability has three big benefits. Customer relations, bottom line savings, and saving the planet. Improved customer relations. Studies have shown that consumers prefer to support companies with a track record of sustainable practices. Bottom line savings. Studies have shown you can actually improve your bottom line by implementing sustainable initiatives. And we've got lots of examples in the book about that. And saving the planet. After an initial environmental audit, you can subsequently prove that your efforts are reducing your carbon footprint, among other things. Next, how to start your sustainability program. 
you begin, and we think this is absolutely essential, you have to begin with the third party consulting firm analysis. Because number one, they know what they're doing, you don't. Number two, it, it says transparency, it says honesty. And number three, they can give you ideas about how to deal with your carbon footprint that you would, would not have thought of either. Number two, next slide. Number two, establish a baseline. Figure out what it is you're doing now so from, the, from this point on you can show progress. Then you wanna get the staff brainstorming. What do they think you should be doing? Because they're the ones who are gonna be executing it, right? And so if you start with the staff brainstorming, you won't have to worry about buy-in because the ideas are coming from the bottom up. Then you wanna create a mission and measurable goals so you can so show progress. And there's a fifth one, that, that is you should publish your progress against the goals regularly so your readers can see the progress you're making and be reminded that you are trying. Next, please. So here from the book are several examples of things you can do from very, very simple stuff, big things like eliminating plastic wraps that takes a lot of work and time and, and research to ink optimization, for example, using virtual page proofs instead of paper page proofs, reducing the size of your direct mail package. Next. Replacing bottled water with filtered water. This is, I thought this was pretty clever. Set your printers to default to double-sided. Cuts your paper use in half. Reduce paper and plastic cups with mugs. Use LED lights. Now in the book, we go into great detail on long and short-term strategies to win the sustainability space. We have 22 big and small specific sustainability initiatives from global leader Meredith. We have some corporate level sustainability commitment examples from the post sustainability poster child, The Guardian which earlier just this year stopped taking ads from oil and gas companies. And in 2016, they divested all oil and gas stock. And then a thing on how to, to get rid of plastic wraps. So in the book, we also talk about, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning, 13 monetization models. What are the things you can be doing to build your business model that works for you? What, how you can launch and monetize podcasts? How you can get very creative in uh, content? And then our favorite chapter, which is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the print and offbeat innovations. What is the human mind coming up with that is fun and creative in, in, um, in print? So welcome back, everybody. I'm here. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation, gentlemen. Excellent as usual. We've had plenty of questions from the audience, some of which have come through other means. So we've put them on our little screen here. I'm going to start with uh, going back to the question at the beginning about remote working. What advice do you have for publishers on developing talent? This has come up actually in a few of our discussions with uh, leaders in the industry recently. How do you develop people in distributed workplaces or in remote working? Have you come across any experiences of that? Uh, John, you want to um, kick it off? Well, we've seen lots of people who have uh, scrambled to take what they had as a training program that was mostly... Uh, well, it was not regularly scheduled, it was hit and miss, it was not uh, digitized for sure. It was basically the HR person would get people together every now and then they'd hold, they'd hold a brown bag lunch. And what we've seen, not many companies, but some companies do, is come up with a very aggressive, planned, digitized videos with workbooks, with a schedule, with agendas, uh, around the topics. What they did was they surveyed the staff at home and what they might've thought was appropriate in a training program before COVID-19, more or less wasn't what was appropriate now. And what they found were things that had to do with um, the Zoom meetings, how to coordinate meetings, how to motivate people, how to stay in touch with your staff if you're an editor, how to stay in touch with one another if you're a staff member or a reporter. And they put these things together in regularly scheduled meetings that were designed to not only convey information and do training, but also to keep that, that contact established between you as the editor doing the training and your staff. Mm -hmm. The other thing I saw was a, um, a company that did regular check-ins. They took it upon themselves knowing how that some people working from home could be very stressed, whether it's children at home or being alone at home. And they just kind of set up a regular schedule of calls from the editor to the writer uh, or from the sales director to the sales staff just basically saying in not so many words, how are you? And as the speaker just before us talked about, that mental health piece of this puzzle right now, as long as we're doing this remote work, 
is, is absolutely critical. If you're an editor, if you oversee people, uh, you should be on the phone or on the Zoom with no reason other than just to say, how you doing? You know, because if you're only calling for the reason, then they're not sure you're concerned about them. And right now we have to be very concerned about them. I want to pick up on the point that Juan made at the beginning about um, be careful that the new normal does not become normal. <laughs> Uh, I, f I think that's exactly how you phrased it. We've spoken to a few uh, of our kind of publishing industry leaders over the last few uh, weeks and sessions, and a lot of them are saying that while people are starting to trickle back into the office, that they're not planning to do any kind of proper return until January or possibly even beyond. Do you think there's a point, Wan, at which it's just going to become normal by default, the way that we've ended up working, because it's going on for such a long time, because there seems to be the sign of a second wave, because there is no imminent prospect of a vaccine. What, what do you think about that? No, I mean, on this one, I'm, I am convinced that, uh, that, that humans are not programmed to work from home, uh, no matter how uh, imperative this is. It's actually exactly the opposite. If you think about it from a human resources management point of view, um, you know, people are now associating staying at home with the, the, the punitive aspect of this experience, uh, the quarantine, uh, you know, uh, uh, not being able to, to, to go out uh, for fresh air and so on. So if on top of it, you expect them to be productive, um, uh, you're up, you know, you're going to have a big surprise. So and we've already seen, uh, you know, not official um, studies that one could say are definitive proof, but a number of anecdotal studies saying productivity is going down. Mm -hmm. um, home is for resting. Home is your shelter. Home is your castle. Home is where you go to switch off. Um, and, and that important balance between work life and home life is now being so confused. And and, and it, 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 to think that this is the new normal is just not to understand human beings. Um, you're gonna have lower productivity. You're gonna have stressed out workers. Now, this does not mean that you should not offer flexible working hours. Absolutely. And you should uh, punish people because they got infected and they have to quarantine or, or their schools have been quarantined. That, that's entirely different. That's showing human resources flexibility. And, and back to your early point as to best practice, we, we, I've just come across one publisher that is doing not mandatory, but suggested uh, one day a week. So just let's get started with one day a week. And uh, if you do have a periodical um, publication cycle, um, you know, we all know the old saying in magazines that magazine people only work once a week or once a month or once a quarter. You know, the joke that you all come together the day before publication and you all cram, spend the whole night putting the publication together. Um, so uh, that magic that happens with the collaboration, uh, it's, you, you cannot do this from home. And, and so don't, don't shut down your offices. Don't, um, don't, don't, don't make this some, some, somehow part of your solution. Look at all the money we're going to save because we shut down our offices and we all go to a WeWork space or Starbucks. It's just not going to work. And you're going to be faced with rehiring and reopening the offices and all that expense. So beware of this new narrative that somehow um, it's just for all the reasons I mentioned and, and very much what John has been talking about. Uh, job satisfaction, uh, people need to... Uh, to, to have adult conversation if you're a <laughs> parent. <laughs> you need that gossip, you, uh, you know, why the water cooler? You need that. I, and look, a, a very interesting insight is uh, when people commute, even though people complain a great deal about the commute, uh, the commute uh, from the point of view of productivity mm. is brilliant for you uh, as an employer because uh, it's like when people go for a walk, uh, everything lands in your head and you begin to figure out and you're thinking, okay, I'm, so that gap that you have between switching off from home duties to work duties is a very productive period uh, where people say, oh yeah, got it. Okay, this issue that I had, this is how I'm going to resolve it. Because you know you go into that work theater where you must perform. So uh, when you blur that line and you go from your bedroom to, to, to your office in one step, it's just madness. So not to this new normal, please. 
let me just come on to podcasting because I think this is a really uh, interesting little uh, mini case study of what's happening in the industry right now. So we're seeing obviously an explosion in, uh, there is a whole chapter by the way in the book on podcasting, which is why I refer to this. We're seeing an explosion in the number of people listening to podcasts. Obviously the volumes are going up, the listening figures are going up um, and, and there is some evidence that that has happened and continued in lockdown. Spotify, Apple, all the rest of these companies have made big bets on podcasting. How do you see that playing out for the future? Is there really a sustainable revenue model here, do you think, for publishers in the long term with podcasting? Well, the, the monetization model is still a work in progress. Uh, what people have seen is obviously the, the holy grail of uh, podcast advertising is having that uh, revered, the trusted uh, host read the advertisement. Those things work like, like gangbusters. Not every host is willing to do that. But increasingly, for example, the NPR here in the United States is seeing massive increases in traffic. They saw drops in their radio, of course, because no commuting, but their podcasting audience has just skyrocketed. Mm. Uh, and they have been able to monetize that. Uh, I recently heard a uh, commentary on podcasting in one of the Congress sessions that said, oh, there's just too many podcasts out there. Well, there are three, 35 million YouTube channels. There are... Five, what is it, uh, 750,000 podcasts on the Apples. That, that's, that's an order of magnitude difference. There's still plenty of space for podcasts that address mostly niche topics that are of passionate interest to small communities or to mm. communities that you can monetize. Um, because of, if we do get back to the commuting, and even if we don't, we're finding people are taking the time to listen whether it's on Alexa or whatever it is, they're listening. And anytime you have an audience of that size and an identifiable niche, a community of shared passions, you can monetize it. We just have to figure out how. Um, yeah, to that, uh, just a warning, uh, James, I'm sure you've come across this. Um, even though the numbers of, of podcasts have gone up, uh, the habit has been broken uh, for many publishers. And they're seeing the data very clearly. Um, as John said, uh, podcasts uh, were booming uh, at a time with long commutes and, and people just, you don't want to be in the tube, in the underground, in a bus, trying to scan, you want to be alert. So you listen to the information that matter to you. Uh, when people are not commuting, um, the, the number of, uh, of listeners has dropped, down, dropped dramatically. Um, the, the other insight, and, and, and John in the last few years has done a brilliant job tracking down best practice when it comes to this. Um, we see a lot of publishers making the old mistake of, of, of skeuomorphism. You take the old uh, sort of uh, model of storytelling and you transfer it to an audio one. So let's talk about the story. Um, uh, you know, with all, with all my admiration for The Economist, it's just the absurd, get, get an actor to read a story. <laughs> just uh, uh, look, that's not the podcast that are going to make you money. Uh, mm -hmm. Added nice bonus to have to a subscriber's already paying. Fair enough, but if you really want to make money, you have to, you know, do do elevate your production values. Uh, find a good story to tell. Find good characters, um, and 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 indeed find those voices that make it happen. Don't just transport, translate, transmogrify your old uh, text uh, that you've written for the magazine, for the website, and somehow read it, retell it, and so on. Uh, that's just not going to cut it. Well, we're nearly out of time. I think we've used all of the questions that we've had from the audience, but I want to ask you both to close by just giving the industry your one-line slogan or manifesto, let's say, for 2021. What, what would that be, Juan? Do you, do you want to start? The same one that was last year. Uh, only journalism of any sort will save journalism. Only fashion journalism will save journalism. Only consumer journalism will save journalism. Unless you get people to pay for your journalism, it's game over. Uh, so the sooner you begin uh, the journey through a digital paywall, uh, the better. For you, your brand and your readers' chance to continue to consume your content, they will pay. You'll be surprised. John? Sure. Uh, before I do that, let me, I imagine people having seen the chart where employees could rank their companies were curious as to what the sites were. Uh, oh, yeah. It's Glassdoor. Yeah, yeah. Glassdoor, Indeed, Vault, Fairy God Boss, mostly for, about, for women, and Career Bliss. 
and there may be others, but uh, this was created about six or eight months ago, so I would look around for others. Uh, and of, of course, this is all in the book, and it'll be uh, on the slides that you can get uh, after this uh, presentation, 48 hours afterwards. My, my one thing would be to listen to your people. When we go into companies that are in trouble, the first thing we do is we talk to every employee in the company, we talk to every uh, advertiser, for, not every, many advertisers, former advertisers, readers, former readers, because the people who really know what's going on and what will fix the company are those people, but they are never asked for their opinion. Absolutely. No employee in his right mind is gonna tell the person who signs his paycheck that something's wrong. That's just counterintuitive. But if you come to them and you say, I trust you, this is a safe space, tell me what we need to do. Maybe you bring in a third party to do it because it's a little risky. Third party, very safe, anonymous. Find out what's going on from them because if they're the ones who are coming up with the solutions, you have automatic buy-in. And from, there on, from then on, you can see, once that happens, you can see the temperature in a company change. You can see people going from feeling like victims to being advocates of change. And that's what you need because you can never successfully impose change from the top. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Two very important messages there. Listen to your people and a challenge, not only from John and Wan, but from me uh, at FIP as well to our publishing industry members, please start getting people to pay for your content online. There are <laughs> not enough of us doing it. I want this book in 21 and 22 to be full of innovations in paywall and in people paying for digital content because it is just not happening at the moment. So that's a fantastic way to end. Thank you for a very interesting and engaging session as always. I'm sorry we couldn't have you on stage doing your usual energetic <laughs> uh, uh, prowling around telling the audience what they want to hear from the book, but no doubt we will be back doing that very soon, hopefully at the Congress next year. But for the time being, John, Juan, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming on. I know everybody found it useful and we will see everybody at half past four for the next session, UK time. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, James.